Hey there, welcome back. So excited to bring you Les McCune today. So this is an interview and Les is somebody, he's got a bunch of books. I have read all of them. Um, I'm really, I just love the way he teaches. He, we talk about a little bit about this quiz that we use specifically in one of our hiring process steps um, and how it just changed the way that we have done our business. So he is one of many mentors that I have studied from, and I'm really excited to share him with you, especially if you've never heard of him and what he does. So his big thing is what he calls predictable success. And we get into that a lot during this episode. So I hope you enjoy it. I definitely ask um, some personal selfish questions in there about our business, but I think it's always fun for you to hear what we're looking at and, and what we're thinking and how we're thinking about it. And um, yes, I, I really think that you are going to love, love, love meeting Les. Enjoy. Les, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Super to be here, Stacey. Hi, everybody. So Les, you have quite a few books that are out. Um, I have read all of them. I, I love, love, love the way that you teach. I love how you simplify and really show people like where they're at, like an honest assessment of where they're at. So I would love for you to kind of share. Um, and I know we could talk about that alone for the whole, you know, podcast, but I'd love for you to give a quick glimpse into the early struggle, the fun, the whitewater, all of that. And, and how you started to notice that and come up with that as you started to consult other people. Happy to. Um, well, the, the uh, first salient fact is that in about three seconds from now, people are going to begin to realize that although I'm sitting in Maryland looking over the Chesapeake Bay and I'm an American citizen and I've got my passport and I've been here 25 years, I'm originally not from these parts. I'm from Texas. I, I'm from <laughs> I'm from <laughs> Belfast in Ireland. And uh, the reason that's relevant is that uh, I first qualified as a, the British equivalent of a CPA, a chartered accountant, um, right at the point when the UK was going through a massive push for entrepreneurship. And there was a lot of money available, cheap loans, a lot of tax write-offs, because uh, the UK was at that point essentially a branch economy of the US and mm -hmm. South Korea. So if Daewoo or General Motors caught a cold, we would lose 15,000 jobs in Leeds or Liverpool mm -hmm. or somewhere. And so there was a huge push towards entrepreneurship. And I got sort of swept up in that, in, first of all, in advising people. And I became uh, quite well known as, as a person to go to if you want to you know, get your bank loan, get your premises, uh, maybe hone your idea a little bit, find a team member, that sort of thing. And before long, people started actually asking me if I would like to join them on the team rather than just be an advisor oh wow and uh, so or, or you know, on occasions if they had an idea and they'd say i, I don't think I, I can pursue this would you be interested mm -hmm. in doing this and so long story short um over about eight to ten years i got a chance to cherry pick six or eight uh businesses business opportunities mostly businesses some not for profits uh, and before i knew it, i was 35 years of age and had helped uh, launch 42 businesses and even a dumb Irishman begins to see some common patterns. Mm -hmm. And I started to write these down. And I tried to weed out. I got more interested in the process of growth, mm -hmm. how to grow a business, than the businesses themselves. But being a serial entrepreneur, that we didn't have that phrase back then, gave me a very helpful insight into something you've already mentioned, which were that, the, that there were two uh, stages that startups went through. First, I call it early struggle. And it's basically, typically, very generalized. Uh, position three years uh, to get through that if you do get through it very high mortality rate 80 percent of all new ventures fail in three years 20 percent get a uh, fight through it they get to a stage which i call fun very technical phrase mm -hmm. and it's fun because it's not early struggle anymore you know yeah. uh, any of the listeners that have been there know what it's like to be an early struggle you know i, I you're waking up every morning and you get about four minutes to think it's a glorious Thursday. And then you realize with a sinking dread that you've got to make payroll, you've got to buy supplies yeah. and so forth. It's tough time. But if you do the right thing, you get through to this stage called fun. And it's, it feels like fun. You know, I mean, we have our tough times, but hey, I find my market and I'm enjoying doing it. Yeah. Now, rather I, I had a client say, I think I'm in fun, but this isn't fun. So I'm not totally, <laughs> I'm not totally sure. And I think the way you just described it of, well, it's more fun than struggling in the beginning, but yes, there are still ups and downs and things we're testing. Yeah, the key difference is in fun, you have difficulties, but they're not existential. 
Mm. In early struggle, every difficulty is, uh, is existential. You know, you end up, you know, every week wondering, is this going to work? Is this going to work? And occasionally in the fetal position. Um, and so uh, it is a slightly long preamble because it's the foundation of, of really everything that, that uh, came afterwards. Most of us, that's what we think is the story. That's the story yeah. of business, right? You, you, you decide to make this leap. You do it. You know there's a big chance it's not going to fail. And it's not going to succeed. You feel great when you realize that it, it has. And as I say, you have tough times. But essentially, when we get to that stage, which we don't name it, right? We were just right. doing it. We think this is it. I, I did it. I made it. Everything yeah. now is rinse and repeat. Just add more, get bigger. That's fantastic. And what I realized, actually, after I started, stopped doing the serial entrepreneurship, um, I was asked by a friend of mine who's also a serial entrepreneur, um, if he, uh, he had been asked by the UK government to launch what was in essence, one of the very first, what we would now call incubation units worldwide. And we started this thing in West Belfast in the middle of a civil war. And it was an out of the park success. And before we knew it, maybe three, five years later, we had a 13 office firm in nine countries worldwide, helping launch businesses all over the world. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, helping local existing businesses get to the next stage in growth. And I realized really, really quickly that early struggle and fun weren't the whole story. Mm. That there was a very important next stage, which, is, which I call Whitewater. And in essence, what happens is the very success that you are enjoying in fun, right? We just say yes to everything in yeah. fun, don't we? And then make it happen. What happens over time is that the business just grows. We don't really, I mean, we notice it and it's fine, but it, it doesn't feel like it's just, that's what we're doing. Until at some point that growth brings one final layer of complexity that just means we can't come in and tap dance every day. We can't just say yes and make it happen. We try to keep saying yes and make it happen, but we start getting in our own way. You know, we, 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 we fail to turn up for an important client meeting. We send the wrong raw materials to the wrong work site. We, we sign a lease with a stupid clause in it that I really should have spotted. You know, we just seem to be stomping on our own feet. And that's mm -hmm. the stage I call whitewater. Yeah. And in essence, that's a crucial, crucial uh, dividing point for most business owners where they have to decide, do they really just want to go back to fun, maybe regroup re a little mm -hmm. bit? and stay as a more boutique mom and pop type of a business it can still be very large right or do they want to press through to the peak stage which i call predictable success and the way to do that is you've got to adopt and embrace systems and processes you've got to codify mm -hmm. stuff you've got to standardize stuff you can't you've got to start saying no to some things you can't say yes to everything anymore you've got to be selective and uh, that's that, 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 that's the main challenge for that yeah. is um, i'm for the listeners, I'm pointing to my head. It's the four inches between your ears. It's a behavioral mm -hmm. shift that's tough for people to come. So there's yeah. a decline stage, which we don't need to worry yeah, about. Yeah, I was that's a today. whole other podcast. But um, I love the idea of really getting clear on where do you want to be? I've heard you say, and maybe you've changed since I've heard you say this, but you say, I want to keep this business in fun right now. I'm not interested in going there. And I think sometimes when we see these progressions, the achiever in us says, well, of course we have to get to predictable success. Like that's the A plus and that's where I want to go. But you're saying, no, fun, can, you could stay there. So is that still true? Are you still keeping this oh, business? Very much fun? so. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I realized uh, quite a while back, it was maybe 20 years ago, I, and, I, and I've, I've sort of slipped off the wagon a few times and had to uh, regroup myself. But I realized uh, about 20 years ago, I can either uh, help other people, I can either grow my own business into predictable success. So like yeah. grow a McKinsey type consulting company, and I've been there, I've done all that. Or I can help other people get mm -hmm. their business into predictable success. I just don't have the bandwidth to do both. At the end of, of a day working with clients, you know, I can't, I don't have the bandwidth to be doing hiring and codification, all the stuff that I help other people with. Mm -hmm. I think of it as a, you know, <laughs> he says very modestly, as a world-class golf or tennis coach, you know, who's not on the tour playing themselves, you really yeah. can't do uh, both. Uh, but the best ones have been there and have done that. So that's, that's my position. I'll give you a really um, obvious, so when I, when I, I tell the story, it, it, the, the distinction and the value of making that choice becomes very clear. I used to live in a beautiful little um, village called Marblehead in Massachusetts. Anybody's ever been there. It's a beautiful sailing village. And uh, two friends of mine, a husband and wife, had a fantastic coffee shop in that place, which we all loved. It was a really like home for many of us. They then got the opportunity 
because of a lease that came up to open a second unit and they did that and, it, and it, they're still wonderful. And then they opened another one, neighboring village, neighboring town, and then a fourth one. And at that point, they hit their white water mm. and they had a decision to make. It wasn't very big at that point, yeah. even then, but there was only two of them. So the only way they could keep the type of quality that they wanted and what they were doing was to either learn things like hiring, recruiting, training managers, bulk buying, freezing, codifying their recipes, teaching other people how to make the wonderful baked goods and other sites. If they wanted to go and become like a caribou coffee, you know, a regional yeah. uh, uh, player, they were going to have to learn all of that, let alone become a Starbucks. Right. Now, many another person up for that challenge and that's what yeah. they would do. Then you press through Whitewater, you learn all those things, you get into predictable success. They decided, hey, Two units, that's us, mom and pop, we go back mm. to that. And that's a valid, very valid decision. The folks that I really, really try to reach to as often as I can through podcasts like this are the folks that haven't actually thought that through mm -hmm. and just end up ping-ponging in and yes. out of, of whitewater, which is a really painful place to be. Yeah. Yeah, because we definitely felt like we were in fun and we were then starting to head into white water. Some balls were being dropped, some things were happening and we had to take a look at, okay, where do we want to be? What do we want to do next? And what does that look like? And that's not just a simple decision. It's really having to take some time to figure out what that looks like and where we want to go with the business at this moment in time. Right. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And well, one of the things that's important to bear in mind is that when I talk about white water, I'm not talking about, you know, just hitting the normal sort of little growth pains that happen along the way. And I, I'm not talking about an old fudge moment, to use a Britishism. Yeah. I'm talking about getting back to the point uh, where you're having near existential uh, problems. It's not just as existential as early struggle, but you know you're in white water when the things that are happening have a reputational risk mm. and you're starting to say, you know, I think people are noticing this. I think our clients, yeah. our customers are suffering. We're beginning to lose, you know, the sort of even we, we build typically, we, you know, as business owners in fun, we build a sort of an evangelical offering uh, um, following people think they've discovered us and they love us and they tell everybody about us. Yeah. And in Whitewater, that starts to, to crack around the edges. And, and that's one of the reasons it's important to decide to get out either direction, either by regrouping or pushing through. Because if you stay in there uh, too long, um, your client base will begin to, to, yeah. to break away because they're not getting the sort of service that they used to before. Mm, yeah, that makes so much sense. And I think I've heard you talk about how you know, you can, you can bounce around. So maybe you were in one area, but the pandemic kind of kicked you out, or maybe you have had a certain product for a long time, but now you've increased, you've, you've added a new product and you can start with just early struggle with that new product. Can you talk a little bit more about that too? Sure. There, there, there are two important points there that you pointed out, Stacia, and you have read the stuff. So that, that's <laughs> quite all of this. Um, one is that um, if you think of the life cycle as a bell curve, like the arc that a ball would uh, go through if you threw it in the air. Um, the growth side, which is what we've been talking about, is the upswing in that arc. And then predictable success is the, is the stage at the top. And by the way, the, the only reason that you would do all of this that I'm talking about to push through into predictable success, the only reason you would do that, because it is painful, um, is all about one thing, which is scaling the ability to scale that's that's what pre predictable success gives you it's the ability to scale mm -hmm. so having said that wherever you are on that life cycle anywhere on the growth side or even on the decline side which we're, we've um, I talked about um a huge um headwind like a the 2008 collapse the pandemic anything like that that's really huge will push you back down so if you'd got your way up, maybe into a fund, there were quite a lot of, of folks who were in the fringes of, of Whitewater just when the pandemic hit, it pushes you right back down into the fun station. And at that stage, it, doesn't, it really doesn't feel like fun. Yeah. But in essence, what happens is you, you, you get, you know, maybe you just started something new or you brought in an HR person or you decided to open in Buffalo and all of that, that's the first stuff to go whenever something hap a headwind happens. Mm -hmm. So all the, the late, most recent growth stuff gets paired away and you get pushed back. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully you get pushed back. Um, you don't get pushed back so far that you get pushed off the, the grid. You get shut down. And that sadly did happen. A lot of folks 
it's almost like watching the video in reverse. You'd go back to trying all the things that you did before, mm -hmm. even they don't work. And it's like, the you know, you, you exit back out, early struggle again. It's like getting unborn, which is a gruesome uh, sort of metaphor. So we'll not push that too hard. <laughs> yes, uh, headwinds do push you uh, around. The second thing is that, that you alluded to is really important to realize that somewhere about mid fun all the stages have got three stages early mid and late and they're a little different but we don't need to get into all of that but somewhere about mid fun which i would categorize as the stage of most comfort that we've mm. that we've got it that we're through early struggle you, you, you in, in early fun you're still feeling the gravitational pull of early struggle and there's still fear that if you don't do the right things you might get pulled back in there which is true mm -hmm. in mid fun that's the point at which you're you know, you're not thinking about that anymore, yeah. really, at all. You've got a solid stream of income. Um, about that point, a, a business will stop being like I'm making this, the international sign of the little GPS dot uh, on a map. Up to that point, it typically is. The business is, is in one stage. About that point, it begins to become the weighted average of different things. So we've got mm. this product line. We've got maybe that geographical location. We've got this demographic uh, the specific product they can each be in different stages so mm -hmm. you can be in late fun and actually have one or two of your products or services may have actually got themselves into the decline stage you know you may be at the point where they're sort of rinse and repeat they're not really uh, innovating anymore they were great for getting you here but they're they're dying the, those particular offerings uh, and have to trim those off. You can have one of your core business might be, it might hit a whitewater, but you can look and see you've still got some stuff you started recently. It's in mm -hmm. early struggle. It's really important to recognize that because your business then is the weighted average of all of those. Mm -hmm. And the tendency can be to try to get them all to the same place. And that's not always the case. Sometimes you've got mm -hmm. to nurse something through the early stages, the early uh, growth stages, early struggle stages for a year or two. Uh, and, and don't get up, you know, concerned about the fact that we seem a little schizophrenic you right you know you can be busy putting systems and processes in place for one thing that you do you know maybe you've got a coaching practice and you you know you you really you don't want to be you know you're using up a lot of your time with all of the systems and process with all of the stuff around the coaching you want to really focus mm -hmm. on the coaching so you start buying you know your calendly account you start setting up autoresponders you know you're yeah. doing the right stuff there something else you know, your consulting work might be very much just one-on-one -on -one with no systems and processes. So right. you, you just got to be aware that different parts of your business can be at different stages of the life cycle. Yeah, that's so good. And I think also it helps with people who have, they're multi-passionate, they want, they're good starters, right? So they want to add another product and add this and add that. And it kind of gives you a good idea of, but wait, I am in this stage. Do I want to go back to early struggle with this brand new product or brand new niche and changing industries and all the things? So I think there's pros and cons to both sides of how you look at it as well. Right. And yeah. the individual's leadership style uh, is, is really important. And, you know, I wrote Predictable Success uh, originally. Uh, that was the first book in the series. And it concentrates just on those seven uh, uh, stages of growth. The second book in the series, The Synergist, really is the other half of the model. And it's uh, the two the two books uh, together form the complete model. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of our of, of our listeners will, uh, this will be intuitive as soon as I mention it. Successful businesses are most frequently launched by what I call the visionary leader. Uh, mm -hmm. That's somebody, I, I, I don't mean that they get into trances, some that might do, but they're people with 30,000 foot view, prepared to take risks, um, they, they're real starters. They love to start things that shiny new ball syndrome, you know, mm -hmm. they easily, you know, they're distracted because they always want to start stuff. And that mindset, uh, it, it, typically whether they would, you know, use those terminologies or not, yeah. that sort of a founder knows I need to go get myself some people who will do the real dirty fingernail work. It's what we call mm -hmm. the operator. They're the operators are just ruthless finishers. It just makes yeah. stuff up, you know, they get it done. So the visionary, you know, comes away from a conference with, a, you know, a, a, a legal pad full of brilliant new ideas. And this team of operators or her team of operators are the ones that then say, yeah, boss, got it. I'll go make that happen. Just don't watch. It won't be pretty. And that's a successful a team in fun. That's what you need to build your fun businesses, a visionary. And you, you, you really only need, you can have other people have visionary tendencies, but you only want one uber visionary. You can only have one yeah. real vision for a growing business with a growing um, sort of orchestra of 
operators, which I call the big dogs in the business, mm -hmm. and the visionary sort of conducting this. And uh, communications all, you know, one on one. So I, you're giving your operators their marching um, orders every day, and they don't need to talk to each other that much. You know, uh, Jenny's doing marketing, Fred's doing sales, mm -hmm. and Joe's looking after the administration, and they don't really need to talk that much to each other, uh, you know, because the visionary leaders leading all of it. The, one of the key challenges is that to master the whitewater phase and everything after that, if you want to mm -hmm. keep going, you've got to introduce this third style into the team, which I call the processor. Okay. And the processor is just what you would think of a green eye shade, you know, risk averse, mm -hmm. cut, uh, measure 12 times to cut once. And um, in fun, we will have people, what I call mini P's, mini processors. Yep doing just enough process to keep us out of jail, right? So we yep. fill in our taxes, we do our health yep. and safety, we do all the regulation, uh, industry regulations. The, one of the biggest challenges in Whitewater and one of the most important decision factors for the visionary, typically at this point, still the owner, right. is depending on how strong a visionary you are, you're going to be, let put it this way, it's a zero sum game. The more visionary you are, and extreme visionaries edge into what I call being arsonists, mm -hmm. the less they can cope with the processor style and mindset. It drives them crazy. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, a balanced visionary will intel, not just intellectually understand I need this processor role. They'll actually recognize that if they want to get to the scale stage of predictable success, they need to embrace it. It needs to become co-equal with the visionary and operator role. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong, there's nothing evil in saying, I'd rather die. Right. I'd rather open up a paper clip and stab myself in the eye than, than sit filling in spreadsheets for this guy or this girl every day. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. That's self uh, uh, recognition. In that case, you wanna consciously and deliberately decide, like I've done to stay in fun because mm -hmm. otherwise it's gonna drive you crazy. So it's, there's no, no fun and having growth at any price in terms of your own soul, you know, yeah, you well, something that makes you, makes you happy. Absolutely. I love this. And we, before, when we were hiring, we would have them fill out like a Myers-Briggs quiz or like a disc assessment. And when we found your synergist quiz, we started using it. To me, I find it to be one of the easiest ways of saying, is this a yes or a no for this role? Like if oh, I can goodness. see that this person is a high operator and I need somebody to be a, a doer with my vision, great. If I see this person is high visionary right. and it worked really well when, when we found it, we already had a team. Oh, so we started to assess, oh, this is why that social media manager isn't doing anything, but she has a million ideas. <laughs> and I needed her to actually do and implement and post. And, and right. I started to really realize, okay, I've got some people that are the wrong fit. They're, they're the wrong seat right on the bus and they're good, but they just need to move or no, we really don't have a place for them. I wanted them to be a doer and they really just want to come and be the visionary. And I didn't need a visionary at the time. Right. So I think it's a really helpful quiz to figure out who is this person really going to be? I mean, I like Myers-Briggs, but it doesn't tell me if they're a doer, if they're a, you know what I mean? Like where they're sure. actually heading. So I think if you want to share a little bit about that quiz, feel free, because we, we use it in our hiring process. Sure. Very timely because uh, we just took it offline for a couple of days, give it a little pixie dust. Oh. And it, it just went back okay. up. Just went back up. I mean, literally 30 minutes before we started to talk. Oh, amazing. Um, so uh, I developed it um, uh, when I was writing the book. And we probably got more than a half a million people have taken it. And I get emails literally, literally every single day saying some version of what you've said. Mm -hmm. uh, I get I get emails quite a lot from husband and wife teams who, who you know, taken it and realized, oh, that's what, you know, yeah. uh, my, my husband's a massive visionary. He just decides we're all going to Disney World this year. <laughs> and I'm, I'm the operator and I'm sitting thinking, yeah, how do we make that happen? You know, dumbass. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, it is very, very uh, intuitive. And um, like yourself, many, many, many companies use it in their hiring process. I do want to make, you know, just let's keep myself legally right. Listeners, check your own HR advice yep. and legal advice about using quizzes and assessments and hiring, but it gets used an awful lot. And the concept that we teach is something called fit to roll, not R-O-L-L, -L, like rolling down a hill, fit to the R-O-L-E. Um, because here's what happens in a growing business. You bring somebody in, take sales as an example, classic example. In fun, sales is essentially an operator role. 
in, in early strike, it's a visionary role because you don't have any track record and you've got to get out there and wow people. You've got to be charismatic. You've got to get their attention. You've got to, you know, you'll remember what selling and early struggle is like. Then in fun, you find your market and you're, you're able to codify whether you write it down or not. You know what floats their boat. You know their pain points. You know how to sell it. So it's an operator role. You, 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 you get somebody in who's a good salesperson. You teach them about their product. You send them out and they make it happen. Mm-hmm. And so if you were to hire somebody with a high operator profile, the higher their operator profile, the more they're going to succeed. Now, operators, you remember I talked about visionaries whenever they, yeah. they, if they're off the scale visionaries, they can edge into being arsonists. Operators, if they sort of off the scale operators, they become mavericks. I'm not coming to your stupid meeting. I'm not filling in your dumb form. Mm. I have business. I have a job to do. It may not say any of that. It's yeah. Career limiting, but they just want out on the road. And in fun, you get yourself a big dog operator like that, they will mint money for you. What happens then in Whitewater is the sales role begins to become OP, big O, mm-hmm. small P. You bring in Salesforce, you bring in HubSpot, you, you codify yeah. client um, uh, codes, you're, you know, they've got to input stuff. And suddenly your big dog operator looks like she's blowing it you know yeah and the, and the reason is she doesn't have the profile she she hates mm. process and she, she can't bear opening up that laptop at the end of a, of a sales meeting and entering information so she's emailing people or filling a slack channel full of you know the purchase requirements and it's screwing everybody else's um uh, attempt to keep the ship right uh, wrong so yeah. um big dog maverick operators whitewater starts to shine a light on them and that's mm. i'm only using that as an example yeah right 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 so you take so like good. social media where you might need a more visionary role. You take HR culture, you might need a more synergist role. So what I recommend for people is take them, just start with three most important roles you're hiring for or that you've currently got operating yeah. and just spend 20 minutes and think about that role and define it in a visionary operator processor synergist mm-hmm. um, way. Just give it, you know, a maximum two letters. This is a, so I, I mean, a, a clear example is, uh, it's somebody who's out on the road, the one that I was just talking about, it's almost certainly going to be an operator processor role. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got somebody who's a team leader, they probably need to be a synergist operator. So you can define the role and then have the incumbent take it and you can use the result to see whether there's a match. And if not, that doesn't mean separation. It doesn't mean termination. Mm-hmm. It means you can help mentor, coach and train them to more closely deliver. Also, by the way, one of the super things that I'm, I hope that you've discovered is it gives a vocabulary that depersonifies what would otherwise be a personal conflict. Mm-hmm. It doesn't remove all of it, but instead yeah. of saying, you know, Joe, you're, you're, you're really, you're just not cutting it the way you used to. You're, you're able to have a conversation that says, Hey, you know, it's just dawned on me, Joe, your role has changed over the last three years. And I don't think we've really helped skill you for that. Now, that being the case, are you up for learning this new mm. processors uh, approach or you need to be more of a synergist? Now you've got a team. You can't be barking okay. at everybody like this. So I was can- just going to ask you. So you scared me a little bit when you were saying how like at this stage, I have to look like this in the next stage. So I'm thinking, wait, are we firing everybody at certain points? So you're saying you can start to see if they're interested in learning that other skills that they're going to need to start to give them the tools to become that processor or synergist. Right. right. That's exactly right. Okay. Now, a quick um, a thumbnail uh, a, a guide is this. When you take the, the quiz, the assessment uh, uh, uses numbers. Now, you don't, numbers in and all of themselves are unimportant. It's their yeah. relative relationship to each other. Um, anybody who's in a, 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 a sco- has got a score in a particular style up to a 480, the most they can be is 960. That would mean they'd be all in and just that. If you were 960, mm-hmm. measuring, that's all you would be. And I've seen a few of these. But once you you're in, uh, you go above 480, and it's, it clicks up in 30s. Again, listeners, you don't need to worry about that. Just, just yeah. the, the two main points I'm talking about here. Once you go past 480, the closer you get up to that 960 number, the more you're in, you have a dominant style. And the difference between having a primary style, so you know, primary visionary, or primary mm-hmm. operator, or primary processor or synergist, you're a primary operator. You own that style. You're a dominant operator. It owns you. And so I'm not saying anybody that's like, you know, a, a 480, the next score is 510. It's everybody scores 510 and anything is a dominant, is wholly dominant in that stuff. But you're getting in that direction. And the closer Got up it. to 960, the more you are. 
if that's the case, if you have a dominant style, you're going to find it very, very difficult to change. The plasticity mm. to change is harder and harder okay. and harder. But if you have somebody who's in the 240 to 480 range, they almost certainly will, yeah. will, will take the challenge of, of a changing role and they'll work with it. Okay. So I do believe I was in the, I passed 480 in a visionary, but just a little bit. Right. So as, as, as the person, as a CEO, high visionary, dominant visionary, what would you tell somebody like me to be a, become a better leader? Again, it, it depends on that uh, somewhat binary decision of okay. whether you want to move in your biz your whole business into predictable success. Got it. Or decide to stay back in fun. One of the things that a, a, is frankly at the core of making a decision to stay in fun is that when that's the case, the business is still, you and the business are very, very close. You yeah. know, it's like your Velcro attached. The business is you, you are the business and you're the core of everything. You're the central funnel of it. And um, to, to just, you know, pluck a couple of phrases yeah. here for a moment or two, you can use the word founder and that yeah. sort of sums it up. That, that's, you know, that, that, that person's different and you would know that. You see the leadership team, you know who the founder is. Right. The, the, the leadership group is typically, though they may, may call themselves leadership, to be honest, in a positive sense, they're actually enablers. They're there to enable the founder's vision. Mm -hmm. And one okay. of the key transitions to happen into predictable success, and this is where the advice point comes in, is um, I tell uh, the, the founder owners that I work with, one of the things you need to do is you're going to, we're going to stop using the phrase founder. Because that mm -hmm. gives you 40 votes uh, as opposed to everybody else. No, you still do because you own the business. Right. You need to become the CEO. You mm -hmm. need to become the leader of a team. And your number one job in predictable success is to build your team. Right. Number one job, build your team. Number two job, institutionalize innovation. Because probably mm -hmm. you're it. You right. know, probably it all comes from you. So exactly. you need to build your team and institutionalize innovation. And all of that takes the focus from you as a founder owner you're mm -hmm. not conducting the orchestra like that anymore okay. and you know honestly there is not a darn thing wrong with saying yeah i'm not giving that up mm -hmm. you know okay uh, in a in a this isn't quite on the point but it sort of makes it you know you can either be king or be rich mm -hmm. you can be queen or be huge you know yeah. you want to scale and really grow a business you need to move away from the sort of magisterial founder yeah. role and into a CEO role. Oh, makes sense. Okay, last question for you. So when you're talking about these stages, I rarely hear you bring up a certain number. Like you're not saying, oh, when you hit 10 million, you're now in this bracket or whatever this is. So my question for you is, I've always wondered this as I've read and watched things, but can you be in like multiple seven figures a year in fun like at what point it's like Stacey you're fooling yourself like you're not in fun you must go into the next level uh yeah it, it differs um so for example manufacturing is different from right every industry service-based businesses yeah even within service-based in industries um this the state the, the the size you can get to in fun depends on the degree to which it's literally personal deliver delivery okay so a graphic design agency service business can get much bigger in fun than a chiropractor Got because it. growing that type of a business mm -hmm. is people knowledge intensive. And the reasons mm -hmm. that, you know, about essentially people walking out the door and starting up next door, all that sort of stuff. Um, and so that's, that's why I don't, I don't use numbers. Uh, it, right. I assume true. that was why it's just so hard. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's too variable. I, I mean, I've, I've had clients, you know, I've, but one client was almost $1.3 billion in revenue. Uh, and I'm not going to say the industry because I think, you you know, they're clearly a private yeah. company. I think you would know who they were if I mentioned it. But they were they worked. I mean, my job with them was to work to, to they did not want to get into predictable success. They, oh, wow. they wanted to stay funds, a family okay. business. They were being offered to be bought out like every week the other players so i've a business that says uh, and i've got some folks that are in fun 200 300 000, and that's all they're going to do okay so at any stage you can still keep yourself in fun if you choose to if you choose to there is okay. there's always going to be a size limit somewhere okay. 
There's going to be a size cap somewhere. It depends on the industry you're talking about. When I was just talking about massive average invoice value is a very big piece of something, specialized mm -hmm. something that they build. So uh, that allowed them to get, you know, in, in those uh, top line numbers, really very big. Yeah. Um, but you will always reach a cap. There's always a point in it, no matter what you're doing. I, I work a lot with churches, uh, not-for-profits, cause-based organizations, exactly the same. There's always yeah. a point at which you're going to say, okay, we have a decision to make. We either mm -hmm. institutionalize, codify, put systems and processes in stuff, or we just tack back a little bit and stay in fun. I mean, with a church, it might be their fifth campus. They've decided, right. you know, we, we, we're losing our identity. We're becoming mm -hmm. more like a franchise or a club okay. than, than a loving church. So Yeah, so good. Les, thank you so much for being here. Where can people find your books? Just find more about you online. Anything you want to share? Sure. Well, we, you know, we could spread a whole bunch of, of, of links and places all over the place, yes. but uh, I put a, a page up just so folks want to go to predictablesuccess.com. It's all one word, predictablesuccess.com forward slash traffic. Then Perfect. they can get a, a free chapter from my book. They can take the quiz. All my free stuff's there. Amazing. Les, thank you so much. I appreciate your, your time and just all of the things that you've put out into those books as well. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody.